So my name is David Landis Morris. I was born in Tasmania in 1965. Um, I live in Victoria now, but I came across to Victoria in 1987 to go to university. So uh, in Tasmania, I grew up on a farm, a small 50 acre farm. My father was an artificial insemination technician for cattle. Uh, and so the farm was smaller than many other farms in that area. Uh, we had some dairy cattle. Uh, we had, uh, we grew our own beef and sheep for wool and meat production. Um, small amounts of uh, crops and it was just outside a small town of a thousand people on the northwest coast of Tasmania. So at the age of 17 I'd finished high school and I got an apprenticeship as a silver service waiter uh, at Launceston Federal. So I spent the next uh, three years working as an apprentice waiter in a very formal restaurant in Launceston. Uh, after that I travelled overseas for uh, just short of a year I travelled to the UK, Switzerland, a um, bit of Italy, and then spent six months in the US uh, with various family relatives there. My mother is an American citizen. Uh, my surname, which is Landis Morse, so Landis is actually the Mennonite name that my, my, my mother's side, and they are the ones that still wear the weird, you know, black and white get up clothing and, you know, that sort of stuff. And then on my father's side, it's a conservative, what we call Christian brethren background are also extremely conservative when it comes to all understanding Christianity. So, so that was my background. I mean, I'm phenomenally lucky to travel because in many ways, staying with the American relatives was what set me on the path to <laughs> the opposite. Because um, I remember thinking to myself as a 20 year old, I, I mean, I'd already had some problems with I suppose, their politics and their beliefs about the world. But I remember my aunt telling me I was listening to some Christian pop music in America, okay? And pretty unconcerning for anybody else in the world. But my aunt said to me, she said, now you can't listen to that because that's demonic. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, and you'll excuse the racial overtones of this, but it's worthwhile telling the story. Um, she said, well, rock music, has drums in it. I said, yes. She said, drums come from Africa and the Africans worship devils, so therefore rock music is evil. Now, it had a logic to it, appalling logic, flawed logic, however you want to call it, but there was a logic to it, okay? <laughs> in her own mind, that made sense. In my own mind, at the age of 20, I, I, I could even think then there's a verse in the Bible that talks about King David dancing in front of the Ark of the Covenant, um, taking it to the temple, uh, playing the drums. And I'm thinking if one of the major characters in our own religious understanding is dancing, for a start, which we didn't believe in doing, because that was terrible, <laughs> playing the drums, then how is it that it's somehow evil if the Africans do it, but okay for the Jews to do it. Like that doesn't make sense. I can see in my own head the logic was not consistent. I just remember thinking to myself, if this is where you end up in a conservative version of my Christianity, this is not where I want to be. There's something fundamentally wrong. And so in many ways, it was a really good opportunity to see where I could have ended up. And at the age of 20 thinking, I don't want to end up there. There were so many things in that time in America there were some good things, I'm not trying to say that, um, but there were so many things that said to me, this version of Christianity that you've grown up with is basically stuffed. This is not where you want to be. But there was then the question of going, well, which bits do I hold on to? Which bits are cultural? Which bits are actually fundamental? And I'd say, you know, very much a part of the rest of my life has been trying to work out, because why the hell would you stick with Christianity? Okay, as we've already said, it's part of, Part of that colonial experience is part of that thing that, that in many ways people have quite justifiably said no enough so if i was going to hold on to it which bits was I going to hold on to and which bits was i going to say no 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 this is all wrong yeah at the end of that year i came home and the next year i spent actually working part-time back at the restaurant and also doing some work with my church there 
Uh, then, as I mentioned, I came across to come to university here at La Trobe University, and I studied uh, politics and peace studies for four years and ended up doing an honours year at the end of that, so a four-year university course altogether. It was a really interesting time then. Um, the student... I was I was involved in Christian Union, which was a Christian group on campus, but that meant we were part of student politics. And um, so that was the time when the dominant political party in student politics was moving from the Labor Party to the Liberal Party. And so student politics was very fluid at that stage. So you had everything from hard left feminists and uh, Marxist groups right through to the rise of the different um, conservative politics. And uh, while I was there, the actual conservative side of politics became the dominant side of politics. So it was an interesting time to be there. Yeah. So I had internalised a lot of the conservative strictures that I'd grown up with. So um, so when you're talking, I, I suppose, the... the whatever terminology you use, we used to say mores or norms and values of that particular time. I'm still a very conservative church-going young man, okay? Um, but I'm beginning to be hit by a lot of different ideas. So I'm still uh, involved with Christian Union, which is a conservative Christian group, but my politics are beginning to change. Um, I'm interacting with a lot of different people with a lot of different ideas, but I'm still part of a church community here. So I was still involved in a church in West Preston, and I suppose, in a way, there's also questions about my own sexuality, which at the same time are sort of coming into that at the same time. So I grew up in a very conservative, you know, um, my church was conservative. Uh, the politics that, that the people that I grew up with were all conservative. They were farmers. Farmers in Tasmania voted for the Liberal Party. They didn't vote Labor. Um, you know, uh, there were all those sorts of assumptions given. Um, and I think that was part of growing up. I think to some extent because I was able to do well in school, I enjoyed school, you know, um, and I had challenging teachers who actually allowed for some difference. And in many ways for a small country community school, we actually had a lot of freedom and a lot of really good teachers that allowed me to think and to ask questions and who challenged me about my beliefs. So school wasn't, I, I didn't hate school, I just didn't necessarily fit in uh, in that sort of way. So uh, my community in Tasmania, I'd actually, uh, several of the friends had, had, had felt obviously that I was gay. So partly because of my mannerisms, I mean, um, I didn't have a boyfriend or anything like that, but there was just this assumption I was fairly effeminate, so maybe that that made me gay. <laughs> People from the study group, the Bible study group that I was a part of, talked with my parents about me being gay. Now, in many ways, we look back at that now and think it's an appalling abuse of trust. Like, there's a whole bunch of things that were wrong about that scenario. But so much of my life I look back on now and think, well, in actual fact, that was all wrong. So it was just another one. Um, and so I remember talking with my parents about it and, and there was no resolution to it. There was just a, oh, they said to me that you were probably gay sort of thing. And I went, oh, OK, and I don't remember saying that I'm not, but I don't remember saying that I was, you know what I mean? Um, family communications in conservative communities can be quite different to what we're used to. And I have good communication with my parents, but somehow that didn't get discussed. It just got left hanging. And I think that was probably comfortable for them and I think probably comfortable for me that way too. And then I moved away from home, so I didn't have to discuss it any further. And, and I think that's partly why it made it okay to actually hold off saying anything. So I had brought a girlfriend home when I was first working in Launceston. Um, and then when I got here in Melbourne, I ended up meeting my wife, Robin, who was going to the same church as what I was. So I fell in love. I did all the normal sort of in love experience sorts of things. Fell in love. You think they're the world's most perfect person. You can't see that there's anything wrong with them. You're you know, float about happily in a haze of happiness, you know. Um, uh, and in many ways, I didn't have to think anything further than that. Um, I was ready to get married. I was 24, uh, 23 when we first started going out. But we were very conscious that we were actually moving towards marriage. Um, and I didn't think anything further about that. Uh, but 
I did actually have a discussion with my wife before we got married because I didn't have the terminology that used the word bisexual. Okay, so bearing in mind that when we're talking about this getting married, I would be 1988, 89. We got married at the end of 1989. And um, so... I remember having the discussion of saying, well, I'm also gay. And, and yet, even when I say the words now, it's, it's ridiculous to try and think, well, actually, you wouldn't use that terminology. But trying to even talk with younger people now, we didn't have the variety of options available to us then that we do now. And I veered between saying that and not saying that for years. Okay? So your own... And it's, which is why I'm very conscious that I try not to put my own or a society's identity or lens on people who are trying to come to terms with who they are. And even when I use the word bisexual, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm able to use a word which hasn't been that in use for long. Um, so that whole concept of gender and, and sexuality and stuff is just, it's a minefield in many ways. Um, because there are so many different different um, possibilities. I suppose a similar sort of conception might be for somebody who might find themselves um, non-binary or, or gender neutral in today's society. How that works out for them, I don't know. Because you can't necessarily say I'm, I don't know, 37% female, um, you know, 25% male, and the, the rest of me fits in this non-binary thing. I mean, you can't necessarily answer that. So the concept for those of us who are bi can be really complicated. So my predominant experience or predominant, what do we say, Pers not persuasion, there's the right word for it, I can't think what it is, but w would have been male gay. But then I met my wife and somehow changed completely. Um, well, not changed completely, but, but changed in a different sort of way. Because I didn't publicly identify as gay, I didn't have that issue. Um, and in fact, mine's a little bit, mine's quite different because 13 years into our marriage, <laughs> on, on the date of our 13th wedding anniversary, my wife said to me, I think you should find yourself a nice boyfriend, which was not the expected place for, a, 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 not the expected 13th birthday, a 13th anniversary present I was expecting. Um, and I said, to her, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, I'm really worried that you'll end up going through the rest of your life because I hadn't had any gay experiences prior to that or any homosexual experience, or, or however you would want to define that. Um, up until then, I'd, I'd been a good Christian virgin when I got married. So the idea of actually, uh, when I was married, my expectation was that I would be with my wife till the end of my days. It's as simple as that. Um, so we had to do some hard thinking about what that meant. <laughs> um, she had already sorted through in her own mind to some extent, and I needed to work through what that meant. And so we needed to have parameters for that. And so that was fine. But it meant that I was exploring the idea of being gay or um, at what we later came to see as being bi from a fairly safe perspective because I could go home. Um, and, then I had, and then I had to be able to explain to male partners what that meant, that I wasn't actually available for a long-term relationship I was available for being a boyfriend, but not necessarily. And then we had to define that too. So it was a very interesting experience. But it, obviously, by this stage, I'm in my mid-30s, uh, yeah, mid to late 30s. And so, yeah, that gave rise to some really interesting relationships, which continue to this day not um, as, as great friends. Um, I'm not in a relationship with a male at the moment, and that's, that's fine. Um, but it did mean that, the identification stuff and the discussions that I had with my friends because I didn't want people to be thinking, I, I let a lot of my friends and most people that I worked with know that this was a situation. So there were some interesting conversations there, but I didn't want people to think that I was sneaking around having an affair behind my wife's back. My parents are probably the people that don't know yet. Um, it was We had this discussion, so my wife and I had this discussion. So. Um, one of my brother and one of my sisters knows. My conservative sister doesn't. Um, when my wife and I talked about this, my wife said, I don't want to have this discussion with your parents because she said, they're going to be asking me a whole bunch of questions that are none of their business. And she said, my parents will not want to know.
So we had to have the discussion about who knew and who didn't know. Um, but she said, I, you, yeah. I said, well, what happens if I'm asked a question? She said, you, you never have to lie. She said, if they ask you the question, tell them the truth. My wife tells the story of my son and daughter when they were about 10 and 7. I had a collection of DNA magazines, which were game mail magazines, in my, um, uh, my walk-in robe up on a fairly high shelf. Um, and my wife knew they were there and uh, occasionally flipped through them herself um, because the subject matter was interest to both of us. Um, but apparently the kids were trying to find something and she said to them, look, it's just up on the top shelf. My son's fairly tall. And, and my daughter had got the magazines and my wife was sitting on the bed watching them and she looked up to see them looking at the magazines and my daughter had a look at this and my son apparently went, no, shh, like this and put them back up on the shelf. And my wife looked at them and didn't say anything and just thought, well, that's a really interesting experience. Um, by the time it came to me to actually talk to them about it, I said something about being by to my daughter and she was in her mid-teens at the time and did the whole teenage girl, oh, my God, Dad, yeah, of course, I already knew that, you know. Um, my son, when I had the conversation with him, tried to be really reassuring to me and said, look, Dad, I'm the only straight in the group. Um, he said, one of, my, one of my friends is bi, one of my friends is this, one of my friends is that, one of my friends is this. I came up with you know, a whole bunch of different varieties, which for them is perfectly normal. Um, and in, in a way was just sort of trying to say, look, you're, you're just one of the people that you know, I'm used to, doesn't worry me in the slightest. And then we returned to a conversation about taking him to his basketball match and it was as though it never happened. Um, for them, it's not an issue in the same sort of way, but it, I am conscious of the fact that it's weird knowing that your dad was having, I don't know, a relationship with another man whilst you were there. Um, they don't, they've never been troubled by it and it's a fairly normal topic of conversation at our dinner table because we have fairly varied conversations. Um, so they've always, since that time, talked about me being bi and that's never been an issue for them. Yeah. But they're a different generation. So one of the things that my wife said to me, uh, I said to her initially, I said, look, every time I tell people about our situation, they say, oh, your wife is so noble letting you do this. And I said, I make, it makes it sound as though I'm off fucking everything and you're sitting at home, this dutiful, you know, dutiful, loving wife who's, I don't know, cooking meals and I'm the one that does all the cooking, you know. Um, you know and she said, well, I, I said, I need to have something she, because she's a very private person and people ask that question all the time. And she said, well, the line you can use that I'm happy with is that I have the same freedom that you do. And that's the official line, if you like. Um, and that way, she said, I'm happy if you use that. But she said, I don't want to have to ask questions about, you know, I don't want people asking me questions about my sexual life. She said, you're quite happy to talk about it. And she said, I'm fine with you doing so because that's your life. But she said, I don't want to feel as though I have to do the same thing. I said, no, 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 it's fine. That, that's good. But that's all I need. Um, I need to be able to give an answer on your behalf that doesn't tell people what you do or anything, but is, you know, your answer. So the first boyfriend that I had with, who's still a really good mate, um, uh, he's repartnered and, and, you know, has, has a good life. Really happy for him. Um, I said the same thing. Well, what's the situation, you know? Does he ring me here? Um, and she said, look, I don't necessarily want to meet him. I don't want to feel like I have to be on show, sort of like you're comparing us. She said, you know, but she said by the same token, she said, oh, if he rings here, that's fine, you know. Um, we've worked out neither of us are particularly jealous people. Obviously, my wife is not saying you can have another female partner. Okay. And I said to her once, you know, well, so how does this work? You know, uh, you know, she said, oh, no, 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 there is no, no, that's just never happening. And the other thing that I'm not allowed to do, I'm not allowed to have a tattoo. Really? Okay. So, so I always jokingly say to people, hey, look, it's fine if I have sex with other guys, but tattoo? No, no, no. You know, that would be divorceable, you know. So we, a, a marriage or a relationship is a negotiated agreement. 
I stood in front of my church communities and my friends when I got married and pledged fidelity to the wife, you know, to my wife for the rest of my life. And at the time, that was exactly what I believed. But the reality is that like any relationship, you change and you grow. My relationship with my religion has changed and grown. By the time, by the time we entered this stage of, of um, me openly identifying as bi, I had made the move from conservative churches into the denomination that I'm now part of, which is the Uniting Church here. The Uniting Church, I suppose, prides itself to some extent on the fact that it has a great theological diversity that runs all the way from very conservative right through to extremely progressive left wing. Um, and at the time, my religion was <laughs> inevitably changing. Um, my understanding of my own faith was changing hugely. And uh, you remember I said earlier, there were bits of my faith that had to fall away before I could reformat my own faith. So in many ways, that was just what was happening at the time. Um, at no point did I feel like, it's, it's interesting, I, the Uniting Church had, had brought out a document in the late 80s called, uh, that, I've uh, forgotten the, the official title, but it posited the idea of what was called right relationships. So that rather than things being based on a traditional idea of marriage, because it was looking at those sorts of relationships, it suggested that we needed to seek something that was a healthy right relationship rather than something that was based on uh, law, because realistically marriage is a legal concept. There are religious understandings to it, but when a minister marries somebody in a church, they're actually conducting a legal ceremony on behalf of the state. So returning to the idea of my relationship, Robin and I had to work through that in our own way. Um, but I felt comfortable that what I was doing by this stage was, if I was being honest and truthful about the relationship, was not deceitful and not wrong and not dishonourable, if I can use that word. Um, I wasn't lying to anybody. Um, it was certainly helping me understand more about who I was. And the thing I've come to understand since then is by being, if you like, public about it, it gave other people permission to come out as well. Um, so when I, at the time, I was working, I think, in a couple of different places, in, in restaurants, and then I was working um, in, at Mariner Theatres, actually, and I remember the discussions I would be having with younger people would be really interesting because I'd say something like, oh, I'm bi. And when you say something like that, that gives other people permission to say, oh, well, I don't necessarily fit within I'm this. So the discussions I began having with people were completely different because people would go, oh, that's really interesting. What does that mean for you? And so every time that conversation would happen, people would go away being forced to reevaluate something that they thought was a definite. And I thought that was a good thing. Um, I remember another evening, you know, a few breakups, makes it sound as though I had an awful lot of breakups. Again, I'd broken up with, <laughs> with a fellow and I'd gone to work that evening. And I was sitting down for a meal just before the stage show started at one of the theatres. And I mentioned something about how I'd broken up with the fellow the night before. And one of the fellows that I worked with was a Sri Lankan Muslim guy. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. He said, um, you really appreciated that. It was something that was really caring. And I remember thinking I would have never expected as a good Christian man to be sitting here with a Sri Lankan Muslim guy being consoled. And he was very conservative in his understanding of, of, of Islam and, uh, and religion, um, being consoled by a Muslim guy for having just broken up with my boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and we had lots of interesting conversations about civil law versus religious law versus how you understand your religion, you know. Um, and so the conversations I had began getting a lot more interesting. I would argue that it's better for society to learn to be honest. And whether or not that's honesty in religion <laughs> or honesty in politics or honesty in sexuality or honesty in... I think it's better. It allows people, and this is why I think conversation is important, it allows people to be honest about what they are, because I think too often we have taught people to lie to make it comfortable for other people, and I think that's wrong. I understand why people do it. I grew up in that society, but I don't think it's best. 
I think we want to encourage people to be honest. I think the things that the church has done wrong, and look, I'm mentioning you know, childhood sexual abuse, but that's a classic case of why lying doesn't work. You teach people to be dishonest, and then you become, then you expect dishonesty. And then you're surprised when people are honest and you actually choose to ignore the honesty and you push them away. And you push them away so often that that becomes the norm. Um, you don't hear about women saying, this is not right. You know, people are being violent. You don't hear about young people saying, this is not the way I feel. I'm actually attracted to somebody else because you don't want to hear it because it upsets your worldview. And I think, and, and if I can use religion to some extent, I think that's why Jesus pissed so many people off, was because he said to the religious elites of the day, you're hypocrites, you're wrong, this is actually not what it's about, and spent time with people who were actually made those people uncomfortable, the people who are at the bottom part of society, rather than the elites. So when you see his interactions with the elites, he's constantly yelling at them. It's like you pack, he says, no, you pack of vipers, you're a bunch of hypocrites, you know. He throws the temple over, he throws the tables over in the temple and disrupts a system constantly and says, this is wrong and tries to engage in honesty. So I would use that as a pattern of behaviour rather than the dishonesty stuff that keeps everybody comfortable.